All right, we're up to screencast two, and I decided I need some audience participation to make these screencasts a little more lifelike and realistic. So I brought in some students. We got Sally, we got Bunny, and we got Bunny number two. And I'm just going to line them up here and pretend like they're you. Bunny number two is really annoying, constantly talking in class. We're going to work that out later, have a little talk with her parents, which turns out to be my kid. So anyway, let's get started. It is now a screencast number two, and we're talking now about investment. So going back to this formula, and you're going to get really sick of this formula by the time we're done with this unit and this uh, semester. Here's our formula for GDP. Last time we dealt with C, consumption expenditures, and today we're going to be dealing with I, which is investment. So remember what investment is. It's not investing in the stock market. It is when businesses, for the most part, buy tools, machinery, equipment, computers, uh, killer cyborgs, you know, that kind of stuff. And just like any other decision in economics, it's a marginal benefit, marginal cost decision. If the marginal benefit of making the investment is greater than the marginal cost, it makes sense to make that investment. And just like we learned back in resource markets and microeconomics, the marginal benefit of making an investment is the rate of return on that investment. We abbreviate that with a little r. The marginal cost of making the investment is the prevailing interest rate. And what businesses do is compare those two things, and if the rate of return is greater than the interest rate, they make the investment. So we did this again back in micro, but um, just to do it once more, um, how you calculate a rate of return. So let's say you're a business and you're deciding whether to buy this machine. That's capital, right? Um, that's an investment. It has a useful life of one year. Let's say it costs $200, and let's say it's going to generate $220 in additional revenue if you buy the machine. So if you buy this machine, you'll find $220 in your cash register at the end of the year that you wouldn't have found if you didn't buy the machine. The formula for a rate of return is to take the increase in revenues, that's the $220, subtract the initial cost of the machine, divide that by the initial cost of the machine, and then multiply by 100 to turn it into a percentage. So in terms of this example, we want to calculate the rate of return on this machine. We take that increase in revenues, which is $220, we subtract the initial cost of the machine, which is $200. We divide that by the initial cost of the machine, which is, again, $200. And we multiply it by 100 to turn it into a percentage. And if we do all the math right, 20 divided by 200 is 10, or uh, 0 0.10, I should say. Multiply that by 100, and you get the rate of return on the machine, which in this case would be a 10% rate of return. Now, that's not all you need to know, because you also need to know the interest rate. The rate of return is just the benefit. The interest rate is the cost. So let's say that you look down the street, and there's a bank there, and it says that the interest rate is 14%. Well, if you don't have the money to buy this investment, you're going to have to go borrow that $200 and pay 14% interest. So that interest rate is the cost of making that investment besides the cost of the, the actual machine. If you do have the money, you don't have to take out a loan, but you can think of that interest rate as the opportunity cost. If you went down to the bank and put your $200 there, you would earn a 14% rate of return. So whether you have the money or not, whether it's an explicit or an implicit cost, that interest rate matters to you. And if the interest rate is greater than the rate of uh, return on the investment, it doesn't make sense to make that investment. So here's our rule again. If the rate of return is greater than or equal to the interest rate, well, make the investment. You're going to do at least as well as you would if you put your money in the bank, or if you had to borrow money, you'll cover the cost of the interest. If the rate of return is less than the interest rate, it simply doesn't make sense to make that investment. So then the next question is, well, where does that interest rate comes, come from? Um, and the answer is from the loanable funds market. We saw this back in microeconomics. Think of this again as the 
supply and demand for money, for loanable funds, the supply and demand to borrow and lend money. So let's talk about that supply curve and that demand curve that you see. The supply curve represents the amount of money that's in supply that's available to be lent out. Um, and that's determined mostly by the amount that households save. You'll remember that households take their disposable income and they either spend it, in which case it turns into C, or they save it, in which it turns into, in which case it turns into S, savings. And that savings becomes that supply curve. The demand curve represents people that want to borrow money, and in our model, that's mostly businesses who are trying to make these investments. So that demand curve is determined mostly by the rate of return available on various investments out in the economy. If there's lots of investments that have high rates of return, there's going to be a lot of demand, and vice versa. So again, we have the supply curve, and notice that at low interest rates, people don't really put money in banks. They don't really make that money available to be lent out. If the interest rate is 0%, you might as well just keep the money under your mattress as opposed to putting it in the bank. At high interest rates, you'll notice that there's lots of quantity supply. Lots of people will go put their money in the bank if the bank is offering high interest rates on savings accounts. The demand curve, again, downward sloping. High interest rates, relatively low demand because it's really expensive to borrow the money. And at low interest rates, there'll be lots of demand because borrowing money is relatively cheap. And that's how we get our investment demand curve. All right, so notice here that at high rates of interest, let's say at 14%, we get relatively low levels of investment because, again, there's very few um, investment projects out there in the economy that have a rate of return that's high enough to warrant borrowing the money at an interest rate that, that's, that, that is that high. If the interest rate were to go down, let's say to 4%, notice that the quantity of investment goes way up because there's lots of investment projects out there that would have that relatively low rate of return. Okay, so once we know what the interest rate is, let's say it's 8%, we simply go over to the investment demand curve and we find out the quantity of investment. In this case, according to this graph, $20 billion. Now that $20 billion is going to be a constant. That's going to be our number for i in our formula, c plus i plus g plus x sub n. In other words, regardless of the level of GDP, investment is going to be a constant. And this is what we know, uh, what we call an investment schedule. At every level of GDP, no matter what it is, investment, $20 billion. And you can see that going along as a, just a flat line there. Okay, so we have this investment demand curve, and just like any other demand curve, this thing can move. It can move to the right, it can move to the left. So I'll throw up the factors there, and then we'll talk about them kind of all together. Think of these as things that make investments easier or harder to make, just like any other demand curve might shift because people want something more or less. So let's say that the operating costs of these investments go up, cost more to maintain them or acquire them. Let's say that business taxes go up. Let's say that there isn't really that many new technologies out there. Let's say that the businesses have a lot of capital goods on hand. They have lots of machines that they're not even using now. Maybe government regulations make rates of return on investment lower than they would otherwise be. Or maybe businesses have poor expectations about how the economy is going to do in the future. If any of that is true, we're going to see the investment demand curve shift. And specifically, what we're going to see is the investment demand curve shift to the left. Okay, so if anything makes it harder or more expensive to make an investment or, <clears throat> excuse me, reduces the rate of return, we're going to see that investment demand curve again shift to the left. Now, on the other hand, if operating costs go down, if business taxes go down, if the internet gets invented, if businesses don't have a lot of capital goods on hand, if they're already really using the machines that they have, if government regulations make 
the return on investments go up because those regulations get relaxed or businesses think the economy is going to be better in the future, the investment demand curve is going to shift to the right. More investment at every level of interest rates. Now finally, if it's simply the interest rate that's changing, let's say from 14% to 12%, we simply move from one point on the investment demand curve, sorry about that, one point on the investment demand curve to the other. So at 14%, there might be $5 billion worth of investment. At 12%, there might be $10 billion worth of investment. Okay, finally for today, what you need to know about investment is that it's volatile. It's not like C. Consumers always have to be spending money. They have to buy food, clothing, that stuff always goes on. Investment decisions, like whether to buy a machine, are usually voluntary, and they can often be postponed if businesses aren't too happy about current business conditions. Secondly, capital goods are really expensive. Um, we're talking about million dollar projects, possibly. And again, that stuff can be postponed and done at the right time. Future business predictions or future business conditions are difficult to predict, and innovation is irregular. And what this all means is that that I number, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm dying this morning for some reason, um, that I number can tend to go up and down a lot and is very volatile. And since I is one of the things that's going into GDP, if you want to know why GDP is volatile, and so it's important to understand that one of its main components, I, is one of the reasons why GDP tends to fluctuate as much as it does. Well, that was a waste of time. Jamie, school is never a waste of time. Since we have 15 minutes until recess, please put down your pencils and stare at the front of the room.